But a couple of weeks ago, I caught up with the director, Michael Sellers, who is making and has nearly finished making a film that's titled Return to Hardwick, home of the 93rd Bond Group. And this is going to be a documentary. And um, I caught up with him in New York, as you do, and um, wanted to find out more information because, let's face it, we're always fascinated about the so-called friendly invasion of the Second World War. And this was Michael's reply. Michael, take it away. Well, I guess I, if I was to start from the beginning, uh, my grandfather, who uh, was a member of the 93rd Bomb Group, which he was stationed at Hardwick uh, back uh, in 1944. Uh, he was a bombardier and navigator. Um, and I kind of knew about uh, a little bit growing up about my grandfather's history. Um, not that much, but I was kind of like a little curious here and there. I would ask him a few questions, but I uh, never really got into it that much. Um, as I got into my 20s, um, I was out of college, and he called me up one day and said, do you want to go to reunion with me? And I said, reunion? Reunion for what? And then he started to explain that it was uh, something that he's been doing since the 60s, the 70s, he went in the 80s, the 90s. He would go to uh, his second air division reunions, which... Um, the second air division was in the eighth air force, which the eighth air force was in Europe, um, for those that don't know, but he, uh, said, yeah, they have, they hold these reunions and they're all over the place. This one just happens to be in England, uh, back where he was stationed. So I, of course I was like, Hmm, trip to England, <laughs> of course, no problem. So I was really enthusiastic about it. And, uh, really started getting into it and started asking him questions. And I decided to make a small family documentary at that point. And I got my camera. I was visiting him months before the trip anyway. So I got my camera and started recording him. And uh, being the novice at that point, I mean, I did go to two different film schools and was out of college, but I had never made a documentary before, um, let alone for the family or anything like that. So I started interviewing him and started getting questions. So that's where I got a lot of my initial answers from him of what he did during the war, where he was stationed and all that in his home months before our trip. Uh, and this was in 2001. And we all jumped on a plane and went over and, and met up. And the second air division has this whole week of events that went on. Yeah. Uh, and and at that point, uh, I think I had about four little DV tapes with me, which back in the day, of course, we did shoot with tape. Um, this is 2001 again. And I didn't have enough tapes. <laughs> I kept, <clears throat> excuse me, I kept shooting and shooting and I ran out of tapes probably the first day. Uh, and each one of those little tapes are about an hour. So uh, I went out to the store and there and they had tapes, and I think I bought about 25 of them, and I think I used every single one of them that week. Um, and I was fascinated. I was hooked at that point of the history, seeing it firsthand. Um, and if I can go into it a little bit, I'll give you a really quick brief of what that was. And again, maybe some uh, local people in uh, around Norwich and Norfolk know about these reunions, of course, when the Americans come back. But uh, I was just amazed that... Uh, they rolled out the red carpet for, for the Americans that arrived, and they had uh, an opening banquet. Um, we met a lot of people from the Second Air Division that were organizing uh, the event. Uh, <clears throat> one of the big highlights for me, well, there were many, but one of the big ones was the dedication of the Millennium Library in, in Norwich, yes. which um, that was exactly when it was officially dedicated. It was built... Obviously, the uh, old one was uh, burnt down uh, years before in the 90s, and this was the new library, and they have this wing like they did in the old library um, dedicated to the Second Air Division, which I believe the Second Air Division uh, back in the day started raising money for that wing of the library, um, and this was the new one, and we were able to go there and see it um, and, and have the veterans walk through. It was a really great time. 
Yes. And uh, yes, well, yeah, I spent many a jolly hour there sort of looking and research and especially sort of looking at the, the sort of stuff about Metfield, which was, like I said at the start, was my, the village that I was brought up and spent yeah. a lot of childhood. So when you were, so you were able to interview um, a lot of the people that were stationed in Hardwick and, and did you meet, uh, obviously, other people who had been stationed in other sort of uh, air bases around East Anglia? No, I didn't interview uh, other people in air bases, and I guess maybe if I, yeah, I could kind of get into that transition of this documentary as for the family was something very, it was the beginnings of my fascination with what my grandfather did and the war and just learning that history. Fast forward through that, and it really kind of stuck with the 93rd bomb group. Um, I mean, I had access to those veterans I would start going to local reunions in the states here. Um, they would hold it in uh, different areas of the states that, that we would go to. So I probably, since 2001, went to about 15 to 16 different reunions with my grandfather. Mm. He did recently uh, pass away uh, a few years ago, and um, I still go, though. I'm an officer in the group. Um, the 93rd Bomb Group still holds annual reunions here in the states. Um, and occasionally we do get a, a group together to go back over to Norwich and Hardwick and, and visit that for usually over Memorial Day weekend, um, yes. about um, three or four days. And what did you find? Was there a particular sort of pattern of conversation and narrative when you were interviewing people, their memories of that time? I just wondered, it was kind of fascinating to know if there was any little pattern that you thought, God, they, they, they all mentioned the same thing or whether... Yeah, I just wondered what what sort of struck you about the interviews that you were doing with the people based at Hardwick? Well, first of all, I think, excuse me, I think it became a, I think it became a record uh, basically for this group to to get them on video. I've actually spent, since I started in 2001, um, I had like little mini projects that I would work on. And those projects entailed interviewing the veterans that were there at the reunions. I mean, when you have these reunions, Earlier on, there'd be 15 to 20 veterans that would show up, mm-hmm. which was great. And I'd pull out my camera and set it up in the corner and uh, do a little lighting and, and turn on the camera and just start talking to them. And that's where, I mean, I'm really happy that they put up with me because I think they were kind of like getting used to me asking these questions and they probably gotten asked, I don't know, probably hundreds of times, but this kid coming in and sort of <laughs> starting from the beginning again and having them go through all this. But um, it was really a record. Um, and a lot of it was, you know, a lot of them, and, and I learned early on that they don't they don't want to be called heroes. And, and you know, everybody kind of throws that term around, but it's their their friends that they were in the war with that lost their life that were the heroes. So I learned that really early on and, and really started to, you know, sort of craft my questions in a in a in a way that was that was uh, respectful, but also trying to get answers about the bomb group itself and what they did, and also about the history of Hardwick, their airbase um, that they lived on and worked worked from. Um, and some of their missions that they would go out and 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 do. Um, obviously, my grandfather he was open to it, and he would talk to. He had a couple crazy missions, but he would talk about them. There are some people in the group that would not talk about them, and and I didn't, and I respected that, and and didn't and didn't pry or, or go further. Further, some of them didn't even get in front of my camera, and I just knew who to kind of target and maybe and talk to. Eventually, I think after the years that I was there, they started to get to know me. And this kid, he's kind of sticking around. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. uh, some of them did eventually get into uh, in front of my camera. And uh, and that was great. So so really to answer your questions about a record, um, they did talk about the base. They talked about the locals there and some of their uh, interactions with the locals around the village of Topcroft, which was close. Yeah. And um you know, the base was big, so they a lot of them just kind of stayed on their base, jumped on their plane, went and did their missions and came back. Um, but uh, but I did get uh, various stories like that. Yeah, so because I, I suppose just realizing when, when you did that project or started doing the interviews, you, the, your timing was probably quite brilliant because obviously 
you know, if, now that, you know, like you just said, your grandfather's passed away, and obviously a lot of them probably have started to sort of go that way as well, so there probably aren't going to be a lot left. But also I was just wondering, as as people get older and, and sort of those memories don't necessarily fade, but sometimes when things are too immediate, you just don't want to deal with them and you want to park it. But then, you know, a, a, a either years or even decades can make someone change and think well actually I might as well just say how I felt about it because there's nothing to lose I you know acknowledging oneself that you know one is going to be dying soon so it's yeah I just wondered if 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 that age thing kind of almost helped with people being able to just talk about it after years of possibly never talking about it I think it did um I do think there are some veterans that they never showed up to a bomb group reunion. Um, and those are the people that maybe don't even want to go there. Um, I think the, the reunions for the 93rd bomb group tend to create a warm environment, a comforting environment. They know it's a place that their friends are going to be at, family members. I mean, it really is like a big family reunion. So most of those guys that show up feel comfortable talking. Again, there were a few here and there, and they did open up later, but uh, most people that are going to those reunions, and that was my access to them, they most of them will talk and, and have talked. So um, yeah, I think, I think it's probably that comfort of the reunions, um, knowing that they're gonna be people there, that they're their friends. They don't have to go through this whole deal of who is going to be there they already know who's going to be there yes so absolutely and one, thing, that, and one yeah. thing that's always amazed me is when when i've sort of seen photographs and little bits of film you know from that period it was just how young you know the people you know they were and, and and being slightly boggled the fact that they not only at their age but they were sort of having to sort of learn to fly planes and sort of having that sort of responsibility of you know flying over to another country and bombing as well and thinking my god no one you know if i got in a pl- on a plane now and the pilot looked as young as those kids did i would be going oh crikey i'm not i'm not feeling so safe yeah. so that that's amazing growing period you know i just find find myself thinking my god you did have to grow up so quickly and and not just learn to drive a car but you had to learn to take off on a massive plane with bombs and go over to enemy territory and drop those bombs and return and yeah i i I just thought that was that was boggling really that's correct and and a lot of what you're saying is a lot of what we get from the locals when we show up um it's really it's really an amazing greeting that we get um and still to this day and it's something about the film that i do touch on in there of of exactly what you said. I mean, you're running it through your mind, and I know the locals, even at the time when the war was going on and after, um, were, were picturing that in their mind, that these guys showed up. Now, of course, the RAF was there, and they did their part as well, um, but it's that, that extra energy, I guess, and, and uh, amount of people that showed up from, from the States and from America that um, really brought that force towards the war. And, and yeah, there were, there were a lot of young kids that showed up. I have a few veterans in the film that, uh, and in fact, Fernley Smith is one of them, that he was not of age, um, but he just looked older. And when he enlisted, he lied about his age. Um, and he was 17, flying a B-24 over Berlin. So uh, it's amazing that... It that he decided to <laughs> jump over there and do that, um, but he felt like he needed to to do his uh, his part, and and a lot of those guys over there felt like they needed to do their part. Absolutely, no. So you you were sort of obviously I can you completely relate to what you were doing. Sort of thinking, God, on because I love archiving things. So I'm um, sort of really like, and recording stuff, and then you're thinking, this is great. I've got all this stuff that I've been recording, and then you know obviously the project started to grow. So then you you now have the plan of making a kind of a film, and and did that sort of did that sort of come to you in a sort of a, a, one of those nights where you were just trying to get to sleep and thought, you know what, let's make a movie? Or, or did it sort of, was it more sort of a, a gradual process of deciding to turn this project into, into a feature film or, you know, a film? Right. Well, that's a great question, and it's right in my wheelhouse. <laughs> um, really, yes, it's always been on my mind. And again, I think I mentioned that I did a lot of little small projects. Uh, I even think I created a small, like, 
we almost used it as a welcome DVD to the group if you became a member. Um, and it was a 15 minute uh, documentary on the group and the reunions and just a real brief like this is what we're about. Uh, so I always had these little projects that were going on. And then the 93rd Bomb Group, it's a, it's a nonprofit organization. Um, part of the bylaws are to educate and to further the legacy of the group. So they're always looking for projects. Um, and one of the projects, even before the film, was a stained glass window that was put in in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, there is a, the Mighty Eight Air Force Museum. And they have a replica of an old English church in the back uh, of the grounds there. And they raised $15,000 to put a stained glass window of the 93rd Bomb Group. And other bomb groups have that as well. So that was one of their projects. And they were looking to do another project. And the historian of the 93rd Bomb Group and myself got together. Um, and I was like, yeah, I think, you know, the, a film had always come up, something to, to really another way to remember the group and memorialize the group. So we had talked about it. Oh, probably about five years ago at a reunion in Dayton, Ohio. And that's where it came up officially um, to, to, to mention it and talk about it. And also in that way, there was a reunion uh, coming up shortly that the historian was organizing to uh, Norwich and Hardwick. So the timing was kind of like, if we're going to do this, uh, we have veterans here that come to these reunions. We're going to go to Hardwick and visit the base and the locals there. So the timing was getting closer, like if we're gonna make a movie, we need to do it now. Um, and I raised my hand and said I would help. Obviously my grandfather was in the group at that time and um, I was interested in the history and have been to a lot of reunions so they know who I was. Uh, the historian was into it and he has some films and photos to start out with. So it really started from there. We got the vote from the group and they said, yes, we wanna do this. Fantastic. So, and when was that? Really how it started. And when was that? What was what so? So that I'm trying to think back. So that was probably 2014, right? Um, and that was the initial like we're going to do this, uh, and then 2014, 2014 we talked about it. I did say okay, if we want to make this official and make a feature film, which we're talking feature film, we're talking 60 minutes or above, um, we're going to need some money. And the group said that they would initially throw in $10,000 from their bank uh, to start the process going. So I said, okay. I said, that's great. We can definitely start with that. That would be writing, research, um, even some preliminary money to make some travel um, over um, you know, with the trip that we were going to do to Hardwick. So that's what started it off. So 2015 was the initial trip to Hardwick. And that was when we got the bulk of our footage. Um, and we had 30 people that signed up for a reunion back to England. And it was a small group, but it was the 93rd bomb group basically representing. And uh, that is where we got um, a lot of the footage from, from the film, from actually on the ground and sort of what my idea going into the film was gonna be. Excellent. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And are you also using that footage you did earlier where you were interviewing people as well? I just wondered if that was quality, you know, good enough quality to use in the film. It's a very good question. In fact, yeah, if I could back up at that 2014 reunion and, and the historian and I had kind of been talking that the film may be mentioned and they may actually approve it. I did bring um, some HD cameras with me. And we did secure a room in the hotel and any veterans that wanted to, we didn't force them of course, but any veterans that wanted to, we think uh, this might be part of a larger project. And if you wanted to come in for an interview, we will be set up in room so-and-so and you can come up and talk to us. And we, I think we had every veteran of the reunion um, that year come up and, and get interviewed. Excellent. So. So that was with lights and, and just preparing for the future for this feature. I mean, I set it up properly and mic them up correctly and we got nice high definition video. So yes, that's pretty much the initial um, interviews that are, that are in the film. I did shoot with an older HD camera, which I'm glad it was high definition, but years before that with the smaller project that I was talking to you about. 
Um, and I do have some of those in the feature also because it's if you've got the interviews and if they're talking about it, I definitely wanted to use it. So I was happy that I, I had that older film as well. Yes, and obviously some, some people might have passed away by then. So now, in 2018, almost into at the end of the year, um, where are you with the project and, and the sort of the, the completion of the film? Yeah, so I can run through it really quickly. So yeah, 2015 we shot, and I think at that reunion, that was in the spring, uh, those reunions for the 93rd are usually targeted around Memorial Day, the U.S. Uh, observation of Memorial Day, um, and that was spring. So that fall we had a reunion, and I showed them a seven-minute clip. Um, it was sort of the prologue to the film. I had kind of have an idea that I was reading um, one of the newsletters of the 93rd many, many issues back and got inspired by this guy who wrote his vet, a veteran that wrote about his trip back to Hardwick in the 70s. So I actually created a prologue that recounted his visit. And it was done in still shots almost and and images of the base and of a B-24, which we have are lucky enough in the States to have access to a few B-24s that are still, still operational. But I sort of put this prologue together and they loved it. Um, and that was the initial part where, well, if we really want to do this, you guys are going to have to add some more money. So that was 2015. So 2016, I showed 30 minutes of the film. 2017, I showed an hour of the film. And then just this reunion in 2018, I showed an about an 84 minute cut of the film. It was a rough cut, mm -hmm. um, and that was just last month at their reunion in uh, Washington D.C. So that's where it's kind of up to now. I'm actually in a fine cut stage with the film, um, and hopefully 2019 is our year um, to get to get it out there. Excellent, my God, that is so good. I'm very excited about this. This, this yeah. does sound like a great project, actually. Yeah, and thank uh, you. And uh, just lastly, I mean, what, what sort of, what have been the kind of the highlights, you know, the bits that you just, it all sounds like it's been probably a bit of a highlight, but I just wonder if there was any particular bits that you just went, wow, that was just incredible. I had no idea. I think, you know what the highlights for me are, is that when you start with this project, you're kind of like, yeah, I want to get this and this. Um, either interviews with veterans or certain shots out on in the field, which would be Hardwick and Norwich. Um, and, and that was starting to happen and the people were there and my camera was there and we were grabbing it. What happens was when you come back and you start looking at the footage, you have to start writing it. You have to start putting it together. And in a documentary that can be a little tricky because some pieces are just always just not there. Um, unless it was just perfect right out of the gate. Again, you don't always get that. Um, but this wasn't perfect. It, I was just missing pieces. And I did go back in 2017 and 2018, just recently in the spring. Um, and a lot of that was to get some of the shots that are going to fill in the gaps for my film, some interviews that I needed. Um, there's some locals there. In fact, one local, uh, his name is John Archer. He was a kid at the time and would stand over the fence looking at the guys taking off at Hardwick. Um, Never really got a proper interview with him. Um, the other thing that I really uh, was a really great highlight is uh, I have a friend, Nick Coleman. Nick Coleman uh, has Nick Coleman Television, who he's kind of actually around that area near Hardwick. Um, and he has a drone. And it was always my idea to be get to get this bigger sort of sense of the base and, and all the areas around the base. And Nick really helped out and bringing his equipment over. Um, he was there in 2015 when we shot, which was a godsend uh, with equipment. And each year I go back, he's there, and I hire him, and we go out and shoot. Um, and those drone shots really start giving you the big picture of here's the base, and what I've done is a lot of before and after shots, which I'll throw a drone up where a shot was taken back during the war out of a plane, and then I'll dissolve into the current day shot of what that area looks like. So that could be officers' quarters, that could be sections of the air base itself, and it's really neat to see the before and after of how it was such a bustling area back then during the war, and it needed to be, 
and then it was turned in back basically to farmland. And you can see that transition. So those are the real highlights for me of, of going back and doing that. And that was the director, Michael Sellers, talking about the film that he's nearly finished and will be coming out next year, 2019, titled Return to Hardwick, home of the 93rd Bond Group, a documentary. So do check that out. And if you want to know more information, there is a website and also a Facebook page. So um, Google to your heart's content.